So, so there are going to be some slides that I'm going to miss out. Uh, if any of you have any questions about them, then, uh, then do please, please come and talk to me. But what I think is important is that we get across the ideas of, of using these master equations. Uh, the, the ideas are more important than the details. So uh, just let's go back. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, no, there it is. Uh, just let's go back and have a look at this isomerization problem. Um, because uh, what I'll try and do is, is explain to you what this matrix is like. So, so what we've got is we've got an equation which is d rho by dt, where rho is a, is a, is a vector, is equal to m, where that's a matrix, operating on rho, which is a vector. So what I've shown you there is the structure of the matrix. So there's the matrix. And that's operating on uh, rho. And rho contains terms of the sort rho A of E and rho B of E, where A and B are the isomers. So this is isomer A, and this is isomer B. And the matrix, if you look at it, has four blocks. And this one here, we'll call this A, operates entirely on the densities, the, the population densities in A. This block here operates entirely on the uh, population densities in B. This one only has elements along this diagonal here, and this refers to the transfer from B to A. And this one, again, only has um, elements along the diagonal and only part of the diagonal. Um, and that corresponds to transfer from A to B. And so if we go over here, just let's redraw this because it's a bit of a mess now. So there's the potential energy. And so um, here are the grains of A. Here are the grains of B. And obviously, uh, we only get rate coefficients for going between A and B when we get above that barrier there, unless there's uh, tunneling occurring. And so that's why we get these zeros along here until we reach a sufficiently high energy to enable us to go from one to the other. Okay, so, so this term here, then, includes energy transfer in A and also loss of A to B. So that's a process that's essentially occurring within A. We're looking at, at its loss to B. This is the same for B, so we've got energy transfer within B and loss from B to A. And this is the gain in, in B from A and the gain in A from B. So that's, that's the structure of that matrix. <clears throat> now let's put it together in, um, 
with a potential energy surface that, that deals with a more complicated reaction system. And I'll show you one or two of these later on. So we've got isomerization here, but we've also got uh, loss from C to A plus B, loss from D to E plus F. And the way that it's set up, we've got an association. A plus B is coming together to form C. C can go on and form D. D can react to form E plus F. And uh, uh, C can also dissociate back to A plus B. Now, we use a similar sort of approach to the dissociation problem or to this isomerization problem. We set up the matrix, and we finish up with uh, a set of eigenvalues which are equal to the total number of grains, grains of C, grains of D, and also the fact that A and B are included in the problem. Um, so... The, we deal with something called the chemically significant eigenvalues. Uh, so what I showed you before was the fact that if we had a dissociation problem, then we had a whole set, and we looked at, uh, at the eigenvalues, lambda versus pressure. We had a whole set of eigenvalues which were basically energy transfer. And then we had a single eigenvalue down here, which was the dissociation eigenvalue. Now, with this problem, we've got uh, the same sort of behavior, except now we have three eigenvalues down here, which are called chemically significant. So these, whoops, these refer to rate coefficients, or they're related to rate coefficients, and we have three of them because we have three species. We have A plus B, we have C, and we have D. And the total number of chemically significant eigenvalues is equal to the total number of species you're dealing with. We don't have to worry about the products because we're treating those just as a sink. We also have to worry about the species that are involved in the reactive processes that we're looking at directly, not at the products. OK, I'm going to skip some slides. OK, and, <clears throat> and come on back to this slide here. So what we're going to do, whoops, is we're going to look at what we mean by these chemically significant eigenvalues and at how they're related to rate constants. In the end, what we want to use this sort of methodology for is to generate rate constants that will go into a computer model for combustion. So we're interested in rate constants, and we're interested in what we call phenomenological rate constants, and I'll explain what, that, what I mean by that as we go through. Okay, so just let's have a look at chemically significant eigenvalues for isomerization. So here's A going to B and coming back again. So there are two species, and so there are two chemically significant eigenvalues. Okay? In this case, the system is conservative. Okay? There's no loss from the system. And so the system will eventually go over to equilibrium, and there'll be no further evolution of the system. And in a system like that that's conservative, the the eigenvalue of smallest magnitude is equal to zero. And so the system relaxes to equilibrium uh, through this second eigenvalue, lambda 2. So the first eigenvalue is zero, smallest eigenvalue is zero. The, the second eigenvalue is the way in which the system relaxes to this equilibrium state. And what we can do is we can set up the phenomenological rate constants <coughs> for this system, treating the species as macroscopic species. So we're, we're looking here <coughs> at the total concentration of A. <coughs> Excuse me. Total... <coughs> the 
the total concentration of A, <coughs> which corresponds to the sum of all of the grains in A. So we're going to sum up all of the grains here in A, and that will give us the total population of A. Sum of all the populations in all the grains there, that will give us the population of B. Eventually, we're going to go over to equilibrium, but initially we're going to have time-dependent values for those grain populations. Uh, okay, so these are just ordinary uh, rate equations of the sort that you would normally use. So <coughs> there's... Um, a being lost by isomerization to B and being reformed by isomerization from B and the converse for B. And so we can define a concentration vector, which is going to be the concentration of A and the concentration of B. Uh, and we can write down our matrix equation now in terms of these concentrations. So not in terms of the grain populations, but now in terms of concentrations. So dc by dt is equal to mc times c, where mc now has this form. What we can do is take the eigenvalue. I, mean, I can either solve this as a determinantal equation, uh, or we can, we can just take the eigenvalues directly from it. And so the eigenvalues will turn out, one of those eigenvalues will be 0, and the other one is going to be given by the sum of the forward and the reverse rate constant. So the system relaxes to equilibrium uh, with an eigenvalue which is equal to Kf plus Kr. And so going back to the master equation, if we solve for the master equation, we get lambda 2 from the master equation. And that lambda 2 from the master equation corresponds exactly to this lambda 2 from the phenomenological system here. So what we can do is we can take the eigenvalue from the master equation to determine the sum of those rate constants for the phenomenological system. So, so that's a key issue here with master equation calculations. We're wanting to use them to determine phenomenological rate constants, and we can do it by recognizing the chemically significant eigenvalues and then describing the chemical system in terms of those eigenvalues. Okay, now let's have a look at an example um, uh, of, of, of doing this. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, sulfur oxides. And uh, so if you're interested in sulfur oxides, Peter Glarborg had uh, a plenary lecture in the 31st Symposium on what he called hidden interactions, and it included uh, uh, sulfur chemistry. And the question is, what questions he asked was, how do we provide rate data for reactions of this sort? And are there hidden complexities in a simple association reaction like this? So here is H plus SO2 forming HO, HOSO uh, plus N. Just how complicated is this reaction? And it turns out to be rather more complicated than one, one would like. So what we can do, first of all, is we can look at the potential energy surface. So here's the potential energy surface for the reaction. H plus SO2, it goes to HSO2. And then via another transition state, a higher transition state, it goes to HOSO. And HOSO can react to form OH plus SO. Can we investigate this system experimentally? Um, well, what we can do is we, uh, we can use pulse, pulse laser photolysis to generate hydrogen atoms in the presence of SO2. And then we can use VUV laser-induced fluorescence to detect the hydrogen atom. So we can look at the kinetics of the hydrogen atom uh, in the presence of SO2. And what does that look like? So here's a, here's a trace, a decay of the hydrogen atom, uh, which is giving us... Uh, a sort of time constant for this reaction system under these conditions. What it's actually giving us is one of the eigenvalues of the system. And we can look at that as a function of temperature and pressure. And 
it turned out to be difficult to get above temperatures of around about 500 K for this reaction system, which was a shame. So these reactions here refer to this part of the potential energy surface. So H plus SO2 is reacting together to form HSO2. And it's pressure dependent because we increasingly stabilize the HSO2. What we can also do is we can do the theory, we can solve, we've got the potential energy surface, we can set up a master equation for the system. We've got one, two, three uh, species, H, HSO2, HOSO. What we do is we work with, a, with a, uh, an excess of SO2 in the, in the, in the calculate, in the, both the experiments and in the calculation. Uh, so we have an excess of SO2. Uh, and so it's essentially H in an excess of SO2 reacting to form HSO2 reacting to form HOSO, and also reacting to form OH plus SO. <coughs> OH plus SO is a, is a product. Uh, it's, we, we, call it, call it, we say it's a sink. Uh, nothing comes back from OH plus SO under the conditions of our experiments uh, or of the calculation. And so we've got three chemically significant eigenvalues. And here are the chemically significant eigenvalues in green, blue, and red. And if you analyze these, then you find that the red one relates primarily to transition state one. The blue one relates primarily to transition state two. Transition state four is unimportant because the route to HOSO occurs primarily through TS2. And then finally, the green one refers to transition state three, where we're going out to form OH plus SO. And they show this really very complicated behavior. Uh, uh, they're, they're not simple, uh, straightforward curves at all. And the stuff that we've been doing here relates to this region. What we're measuring in this experiment is eigenvalue uh, 3, uh, the red one here, we're measuring it under these sorts of conditions. What we want to do is we want to um, try and interpret the, these experiments in terms of rate coefficients for a phenomenological system. Now, here's the phenomenological system. Uh, H plus SO2 forms HSO2. H plus SO2 forms HOSO. H plus SO2 forms OH plus SO. Okay? Now, what you ought to be doing is questioning that final reaction there, that third reaction. Let's go back uh, to um, this system here. And this transition state between transition state three refers specifically to HOSO going to OH plus SO. There's no direct linkage between H plus SO2 and OH plus SO. There's no transition state linking the two. Uh, when we set up the master equation, we calculate the rate coefficients corresponding to this transition state, to this transition state, to this transition state, forward and reverse in this case, forward and reverse in this case, and just forward in this case. And we have no uh, uh, rate coefficient, K of E, going from H plus SO2 to OH plus SO. But phenomenologically, we do. If we, if we look at the behavior of the system, uh, the, behavior, the behavior of the master equation system that we, that we generate and the, the rate coefficients that we need, what is happening is that H plus SO2 can skip over these wells here and go all the way through to OH plus SO. It's called a well-skipping reaction. And it's probably going to be tomorrow that we, we talk about this in a little bit more detail for some auto-ignition reactions. Um, and uh, well skipping in phenomenological reaction mechanisms, macroscopic reaction mechanisms, turns out to be quite important. Um, and a lot of models, a lot of earlier models, neglected these sorts of processes. 
So that's, that's one thing here. And then uh, what we've got is the isomerization between HSO2 and HOSO. Uh, and then HSO2, well skipping and going through to OH plus SO, and HOSO dissociating to form HOSO via transition state 3. So these are the phenomenological rate coefficients. And so here's the macroscopic, sorry, there's a bracket, there should be a bracket there. This is the macro, set of macroscopic rate coefficients that we need operating on these concentrations of H, HOSO and HSO2 and the rate coefficients that link them. And these refer to these values up here. So if we look at lambda 2, what we can do is we can decompose this problem and find out what's going on in, in all of these various uh, complicated behaviors. So, so the black dots there are the eigenvalue, the chemically significant eigenvalue. And uh, the, the lines are decompositions in, in, into various uh, kinetic processes. And just let's have a look at, at what, what they mean. So this is lambda 2. So this is uh, going, this is primarily involving transition state 2, going from H plus SO2 through to HOSO. And at low temperatures, the rate coefficient corresponds to K2 times K minus 1 over K1. And uh, that's equal to K2 times SO2 over K minus 1 divided by K1 times SO2. What that's telling us is that at these lower temperatures down here, H is reacting uh, with SO2 to form HSO2. And quite a bit of the H is tied up in HSO2. These two are actually equilibrated under these conditions. So quite a bit of the H is tied up as HSO2, leaving less to react to form HOSO. And this is telling us about how much is tied up as HSO2. Sorry? Oh, okay, the, we're, we're not including any SO2 because the SO2 is present in excess. So, so, the rate co so we're looking at a pseudo first order rate coefficient with SO2 present in excess. So it's a, it's, a, it's a second order reaction, but we've got excess SO2 there, and so we've got a pseudo first order, uh, order reaction uh, equal to K times SO2. So that's why the SO2 isn't there. Okay, thanks very much. For, uh, is, is that clear? Is that clear than what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so as we go up in temperature, we, need, we meet this, this next region here, which is equal to K, where the eigenvalue is equal to K2 times SO2 plus K minus 2. And so what's happening here is the system is moving towards equilibrium. H plus SO2 is forming HOSO, HOSO and that's reversing down here. Uh, and so, and that's the bulk of the behavior of this system. And then finally, when we go up still higher in temperatures, the eigenvalue is determined by K minus 2. So now what's happening is HOSO is dissociating very rapidly and is not significant in itself in the chemical system because it's simply dissociating. So, so that's a decomposition of lambda 2 allowing us to understand the shape of it. Uh, and uh, interestingly also, that allowed us to determine the rate coefficients for the system by doing this sort of decomposition. And so from this, at a particular temperature, what we can do is we can work out K2 as a function of pressure. And that's the value of K2 that we'll need to put into a phenomenological, uh, in, into a combustion model. 
Okay, and we could go on and look at, at, at other aspects of it, but there are some, some interesting issues that, that um, come out here. Um, TS2 is significant in the region 400 to 800K, and we just found it very difficult, although we can work in this region, we found it difficult to work in this region for this particular reaction system. And so it would be nice to have other methods uh, for looking at this, and, and maybe flow reactor methods would be a way of, of, of looking at uh, the behavior of, TS, of, of TS2 and of, and of this second eigenvalue in this region. And so you could work out what's going on uh, with this interesting shape in the eigenvalue. TS3 is even more difficult to investigate. You need to, you need to go to higher temperatures. And so what we did was to look at the reverse reaction. OH plus SO coming in to form, uh, uh, well, what it does is it forms H plus SO2. And so these are the rate coefficients uh, as a function. So this is the, uh, reciprocal temperature, uh, rate coefficients, really quite fast rate coefficients, and the rate coefficient decreasing as a function of temperature. Some issues with this problem. These are the three chemically significant eigenvalues, and this is the lowest of those energy relaxation eigenvalues that I told you about. What we said was there's this whole group of eigenvalues up here which are related to energy transfer. And what we need to have is a separation between those energy transfer eigenvalues and the eigenvalues, the chemically significant eigenvalues. If we begin to get overlap, then there are issues, there are problems. Uh, and we're beginning to get that here, uh, at temperatures approaching a couple of thousand K. There is overlap between uh, this highest chemically significant eigenvalue and uh, the uh, energy relaxation eigenvalues up here. And, and I'll say a little bit more about this for in a, in a few minutes for an isomerization problem. The use of OH plus SO to calculate the forward rate constants using detailed balance, does detailed balance always apply for these complicated systems which depend on pressure? And there's, uh, you can find papers discussing this by Jim Miller and by Klippenstein and Miller, and for complicated systems, uh, for a simple dissociation, you can, de you can demonstrate that there is necessarily a relationship between the forward rate constant and the reverse rate constant. For more complicated systems, there is no direct demonstration, no mathematical demonstration that this necessarily is the case. But the evidence is that any deviations are very small and that those deviations are mainly associated with this overlap between the relaxation eigenvalues and the chemically significant eigenvalues. This is an important issue uh, in combustion. Uh, I mean, we talked yesterday about the fact that in Chemkin, you assume that the forward rate constants are related to the reverse rate constants through, uh, through the equilibrium constant. And the evidence is that there is, there are, that's unlikely to be far from the truth, if you see what I mean. Uh, so the evidence is that, that we can apply those relationships. They may not be absolutely correct, but they're likely to be pretty accurate. OK, um, that's enough about H plus SO2. Um, Let's go on now and talk about uh, an isomerization problem, um, which uh, generates some interesting issues, uh, which we've already touched on, but we can look at them in somewhat greater detail. So here's uh, the isomerization of the pentyl radical. So there's one pentyl. Can I summarize to form two pentyl? Or one pentyl can dissociate to form uh, uh, the, the propyl radical and ethene, and the two pentyl can dissociate to 
form the ethyl radical and propene. Um, and so what we can do is we can set up the master equation, and the master equation will include, will be based on this sort of analysis here, an isomerization between A and B, and we're going to put into it uh, energy dependent rate coefficients going from 1 pentile to 2 pentile, 2 pentile to 1 pentile by detailed balance, uh, and then also dissociation over this transition state from the 1 pentile well and from this transition state from the 2 pentile well. So that all goes into the master equation analysis. We've got two species, one pentile and two pentile, so there will be two chemically significant eigenvalues. Uh, and these are the phenomenological reactions. So we're going to get the isomerization to one, from one pentile to two pentile. Uh, one pentile will dissociate to form C2H4 plus C3H7, two pentile to form C2H5 plus C3H6. But then in addition, it turns out, we need to have these well-skipping reactions, whereby one pentile can skip over this well here and dissociate to form C2H5 plus C3H6, and two pentile can skip over here to form C3H7 plus C2H4. Uh, so these steps here turn out, directly from the master equation analysis, to be important phenomenological reactions. Uh, the nice thing about this problem is that it's, uh, uh, there are only two eigenvalues, so uh, the chemical, when you, when you set up the, uh, the matrix here, then uh, it's a simple uh, uh, it's simple to solve and get the eigenvalues in closed form. And so this, these, are, these are the eigenvalues on the basis of this phenomenological mechanism, the, the chemically significant eigenvalues, where Kc and Kd are defined down here. So what we've got here, then, are two sets of, two sets of, of analyses. We've got the phenomenological analysis, which gives us these values for the eigenvalues. And then we've got the master equation analysis, which generates those chemically significant eigenvalues. And so we can just equate the two. Question. Yep. Is the M matrix such that the eigenvalues will always be real? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, the, they're, um, all of the diagonal terms are negative. And so all of the eigenvalues are real and negative. So there's, there's there's no, there's no imaginary terms, and there are no positive eigenvalues, so it doesn't explode. Uh, will they all be unique also, like the positive definite kind of structure? They, they will, in principle, all be unique, yes. Uh, the, uh, there will be interactions between them. So, I mean, it's a bit like quantum mechanics. You get perturbations between, uh, between energy levels, which are the eigenvalues, and you get perturbations between the eigenvalues here. But, but in, but in principle, you can determine unique eigenvalues from them. OK, let's have a look at the results of this analysis. And uh, I'll mention later on um, our master equation code, which is called MESMA. Uh, and um, the way in which we extract the rate coefficients, uh, the phenomenological rate coefficients from the eigenvalues, uh, is we use an eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition, which is due uh, to Bartis and Widom. Uh, so we use a methodology which really derives from a 1970s paper by them. Uh, any of you uh, uh, have been to Cornell, you'll know Ben Widom, who is a very famous uh, statistical mechanician. Um, and uh, so, uh, so the methodology we use derives from them. But there are, there are various ways in which you could do this. Uh, but our code uses this bartis widom analysis. OK, so what do we find? Uh, so this is 400K. 
Uh, and so the system is um, reacting quite slowly. This is a very low temperature. Um, and so what we see is uh, our solutions for these various rate constants. So there's, there's case 7, which is uh, 1 C5H11 going to 2 C5H11. There's K minus 7, which is coming back again from 2 C5H11. This one here, dash dot, is actually, where are we, is K10. So it's this one here. Sorry, no, it's this one here. 2C5H11 going to C2H4 plus C3H7. And this one here is, is, the, is the other process. Sorry, I can't see. Uh, this is double dots, so that's K11, sorry. So, and this one here is K10. So this, this one up the top here is this well-skipping reaction where 1C5H11 goes to C2H5 plus C3H6, skips from here to here, and this one is the other one going in that direction here. And they sh it shows an interesting behavior. So what happens is, as you increase the, the pressure, the rate coefficient increases in the standard sort of way, and that's because we're getting more and more energization of 1C5H11. But as we, and, and that 1C5H11 is able to skip over this barrier here and form the products. Uh, as we go up in pressure, though, what happens is the rate coefficient begins to decrease, and it decreases because we're beginning to stabilize into this two-pentile uh, well. So the stabilization is beginning to win over the well skipping. And so this rate constant underneath it is the, uh, the standard reaction of one pentile going over this barrier, and then we have the two pentile coming down here as well. So, so what that shows you is that at low pressures, these well skipping reactions can be really quite important. And in this system, at, at low temperatures and low pressures, they are actually dominating the reactive process. Not the isomerization process, but dominating the reactive process. And uh, here's at higher temperature, so this is well within the experimental range. Uh, and here's uh, at low temperatures, sorry, at low pressures, several processes are contributing, but we can see those well skipping reactions dying off as we go up in pressure. As we go, notice that the turnover point occurs at higher pressures for these higher temperatures. Uh, that's because we've got a wider distribution of molecules because they're more widely spread throughout the energy levels. Um, and uh, as you go up further and further in temperature, then that turnover region will move to higher and higher pressures. Professor? Yeah? No, there is a potential surface. You're, what, what's happening, all, that, all that's happening is your, um, uh, so, so what we're saying is we're going from this position here, we're then going through this energized state of, so there's A, there's B, one pentile, two pentile. We're going through this energized state of two pentile, and then we're moving over that barrier there without any stabilization. So there's uh, there, there, there are transition states, yes. I mean, there's a transition state there, and it, you're going over that transition state. And then there's another transition state out there, and you're going over that transition state. But it never actually stabilizes 
it, never, it doesn't stabilize until you go to high pressures. Uh, <coughs> One of the complications is uh, that above here, then it, we assume that we can distinguish between one pentile and two pentile. Uh, but there are going to be really very strong interactions between them. Uh, but the key thing here is that we're moving over this transition state to here and over that transition state to there without any stabilization occurring. So that's, that's a well-skipping reaction. This, what this slide does is it shows the eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and the various rate coefficients. And lambda 3 is the smallest magnitude energy relaxation eigenvalue. So what we said was there are only two chemically significant eigenvalues. Uh, those are lambda 1 and lambda 2. Lambda 3 is the smallest of the energy relaxation eigenvalues. And you can see that at higher temperatures, we're beginning to get overlap between them. And this then makes it very difficult to, uh, to do the decomposition from the eigenvalues into the rate constants because there's not necessarily a unique relationship between them. There is there is getting to be some energy relaxation occurring on the time scales of the chemical reactions. And that screws things up. Um, this, these are a couple of slides on playing around with the rate coefficients. Uh, so this is doing binomial expansions on lambda 1 and on lambda 2 uh, and looking at how well those expansions perform, but we, we won't worry about that too much. But what we'll do is we'll go to this slide here, and this shows you the concentrations of the species. Now, um, one of the things I said was that uh, this overlap of eigenvalues screws things up. It's difficult to go from this bartis widom analysis to get reliable rate constants because of this overlap between the energy relaxation eigenvalues and the chemically significant eigenvalues. But the master equation returns accurate energy profiles, as a, sorry, accurate concentration profiles as a function of time. So what we can do is we can add up the concentrations in all of these grains and that gives us the concentration of one pentile. Add up the concentrations in all of these grains, that gives us the two pentile. We can also have a look at the amount of products that are formed. Um, and so <clears throat> this is what the decay profile looks like. So, so here's, this is at a temperature of 600 K, where we have no problems with eigenvalue overlap. And what we see is that one pentile decays away, two pentile grows in, and then they, they, the ratio of them stays pretty much the same here, and that's because they've equilibrated. So one and, and two pentile have equilibrated. And then what happens is they begin to decay away, and that's because they're forming the products. So they're going over these energy barriers and forming the products. And so there's the total of one pentile plus two pentile. Uh, there's the one pentile. There's the two pentile. <clears throat> and that's all understandable and logical and well described by the eigenvalues. So, so these full lines here correspond to the, so the, 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 the symbols are the solution coming directly from the master equation by adding up these grain concentrations. And the lines come from the eigenvalue decomposition that gives you the phenomenological rate constants. And we can also work out 
how much of each of the products we get. This is 1,000K. And at 1,000K, here are the results that we get from the master equation analysis. Uh, so uh, there's, there's the decay of one pentile. Here's a two pentile growing in and then decaying away. There's the decay of the total uh, pentile radical system. And here are the results from the eigenvalue decomposition. These are the phenomenological rate constants that we get from uh, the bartis widom analysis. And it doesn't work. Uh, so, so these rate constants are not describing the system very well. There is something occurring at very short time scales, time scales of less than 10 to the minus 8 seconds, which is significantly, I mean, it's reduced the one pentile concentration by almost 20%. Uh, and the two pentile has grown in more rapidly than the simple uh, eigenvalue analysis would, uh, would tell you. And so this shows one of the deficiencies of using these eigenvalues to generate the rate constants under conditions where you get this overlap between the chemically significant eigenvalues and the relaxation eigenvalues. We can still use the concentration profiles that come out of the master equation analysis, uh, but it's actually quite difficult to describe them in terms of simple chemical reactions. So, so this, this is something of a problem that was highlighted several years ago by Wing Sang from, from NIST, uh, and this is demonstrating what's going on for this one pentile system. So, uh, conclusions on this part, um, all wells can contribute to all sink channels irrespective of whether or not they are directly connected uh, to the transition state that leads to a given set of products. So this is well skipping. So well skipping is important and we'll mention this in a bit more detail tomorrow. So well skipping is significant and characterized by non-standard fall-off curves. So those curves where the rate coefficient increased with pressure and then decreased, uh, which exhibit a decline in the rate coefficient with increasing pressure, indicative of competition between collisional relaxation and reaction. <clears throat> now, these reactions can be important in combustion, as we'll see tomorrow. Uh, but they don't have a pressure dependence that conforms easily to that Troy analysis that I mentioned yesterday. And uh, codes like Chemkin are wedded to um, uh, the use of a, 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 a Troy methodology, a Troy type methodology, to determine the pressure dependence of the reaction. What would be much better in many ways would be if it were possible to put. Uh, numerical uh, values directly, which depend on pressure, directly in, into Chemkin. It's difficult to do that, uh, and it's difficult to do that in a system where the, in a, in a simulation where the pressure is changing, uh, but, but certainly it's a problem if these well-skipping reactions are significant. Uh, for the pentile system, it turns out the product yields are very, very sensitive to the difference in dissociation energies for one and two pentile. The calculations give a difference of only four kilojoules per mole, one kcal. What we said was that that's the level of uncertainty in the calculations. And these calculations were, were not fitted in any way to experimental data. There's, there is a lot of experimental data available, uh, uh, which we're investigating, uh, and in particular, there is a set of shock tube data that's come recently from NIST where they've looked at product yields for this reaction system under a very, very wide range of conditions. Uh, they've done fits to the data, but there are, there are possible, uh, using a master equation analysis, but there are possible deficiencies with the methodology that they've used. And this is something, I think, that needs to be looked at. Uh, and, and, and so... Uh, 
unless you do really high-level calculations, which are going to be difficult to do with a system like Pentile, it's going to be difficult to improve theoretically on this value, and so we've got to have recourse to uh, experiment in order to, to tune these, 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 these models and these, uh, these mechanisms. Okay, I think... Yeah. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to turn to some auto-ignition chemistry uh, and look at some examples uh, that come from of master equation analyses uh, that are used in auto-ignition chemistry. But are there any, any questions before we go and have our photographs taken? Everybody's happy. Okay, <clears throat> that's, that's, a <coughs> that's a good question. <coughs> so, what I said was that we... Uh, we use... Um, uh, an ener uh, so, we say that the rate of energy transfer from a grain at energy E prime to a grain at energy E with E prime greater than E, we said that, that, rate, that the rate of that is equal to omega times uh, a constant times uh, the exponential of minus delta E divided by quantity called delta E down. I think I probably used the symbol alpha for this. Uh, so, so this is the difference in energy between these states, and this is a parameter. And by and large, what we do is we use that as a fitting parameter. Uh, and so typically, if we've got helium as a third body, then delta E down is of the order of 100 to 200 reciprocal centimeters. The theoretical justification for this is somewhat limited, uh, but there is a paper by um, or a couple of papers by Jasper and Miller, in which they looked at energy transfer in methane. And what they found was that delta E down can be described in terms of a quantity alpha naught multiplied by T over 300K to the minus 1. So it's temperature dependent. And that was their best description coming from this, this theoretical analysis. What they did was they looked at, they, they did dynamical calculations of collisions between helium and methane. And I think this value here, I can't remember, but it was of the order of 100 centimeters to the minus 1. But, but the temperature dependence looks as if it's quite significant. Any other questions? So in some of these reactions, you mentioned that the products don't go back into the waters. What's the physical mechanism that's preventing them from doing that? Okay. Uh, that's... A good question. So supposing what we were doing was we were looking at H plus SO2. Um, and H plus SO2 
reacts at high temperatures and forms OH plus SO. Um, and the concentrations, of these, these are both um, radical species. This is a radical, this is a biradical. They're both short-lived. They're not going to be present in very high concentrations in the, in the, the experimental system that, you're, that we're using. And so, so the rate of the reverse reaction is going to be very small. Um, in a combustion system, though, they might very well be important. And so what, what you would be doing is doing something along the lines of what we talked about before, uh, whereby we're, we're using the, the results that we generate um, from the master equation analysis to tell us something about what's going on in the, in the forward direction. But we would then have to do also another calculation uh, coming in this reverse direction where this, so we now had OH plus SO going to H plus SO2, where well, this is now the sink. Uh, and, uh, and so once again, you're making the assumption, which is pretty justifiable, that the forward and the reverse reactions are essentially, you can decouple them. And there are, are some fairly detailed analysis that have demonstrated that that's, 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 that's a reasonable way of approaching it. But, but that's what you mean by saying it's a sink. So, so um, practically speaking, this, in, in the sort of experiments that we would do, this is a genuine sink. And when we looked at the, this reverse reaction, OH plus SO, again, this was a genuine sink because the amount of hydrogen that was formed would, would, be, would be very small and there was, there was no SO2 present to send it back again. No, no. Um, what, what, I, what I showed was that as you went up in temperature, the turnover point where the rate coefficient began to decrease because of stabilization into the well, that turnover point moves to higher and higher pressures. Okay. So, so at higher temperatures, you actually... at, at higher temperatures, they can still be persisting up to really quite high pressures. We'd better go and have our photographs taken. But if there are any other questions, we can take them tomorrow.